Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. We have um, the great pleasure to welcome all of you to this event. This is the 2014-2015 uh, Chancellor's Colloquium Distinguished Speaker Series, and this is the sixth season of this. So I was, I could not believe when I read six. <laughs> it has been really great that um, we've had this series for such a long time and we really enjoyed the opportunity to listen to our speakers and also interact with them um, here in form of a conversation and with you, the audience, but also during the reception after this event, as you will hear um, later. Uh, we started this series primarily because we wanted to get the opportunity to hear from people who have had the um, um, roles um, that, uh, well, they led either universities or other organizations, uh, public or private, who had the opportunity to think about higher education and the various challenges that we are facing. And we had, I believe, and I include myself in that, we have learned so much. I have been surprised so much to learn many new things every time we have a new speaker. And we have enjoyed having all of you here in the audience because I know that this series also attracts many members of our community. We are very fortunate today to have with us Dr. Shirley Tillman, a celebrated teacher scholar and pioneer in molecular biology and the first woman to serve as president of Princeton University. I will introduce Dave Beale, who is the um, director of the UC Davis Humanities Institute and the Emmanuel Riggenblom Distinguished Professor of History, who will then introduce our speaker and also will introduce our moderator for this afternoon, Vice Chancellor for Research, Harris Lewin. So with that, I would like to ask Dave to come forward. And again, thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Thank you. Oh, I, I need the script. <laughs> I could do it off the top of my head, but I don't think you'd be very impressed. <laughs> um, thanks very much, <clears throat> Chancellor Katehi. Um, uh, Davis Humanities Institute is pleased to be a uh, co-presenter of the Chancellor's Colloquium uh, with the Chancellor's Office. Um, and welcome to all of you. Uh, thanks for coming for this conversation with uh, Shirley Tillman. Our format this afternoon will begin with opening remarks by Professor Tillman entitled The Best of Times, The Worst of Times, Life and Biomedical Science, followed by a discussion with Vice Chancellor Lewin. Then the audience will, of course, be given a chance to ask questions. Allow me to introduce first our moderator, Vice Chancellor uh, Harris Lewin. Uh, in addition to serving as Vice Chancellor for Research, Harris Lewin is a professor of evolution and ecology and holds the Robert and Roosevelt Osborne Endowed Chair. Professor Lewin's current research interest is in mammalian genome evolution. He and his collaborators are studying how mammalian chromosomes evolve and the role of chromosome rearrangement in adaptation, speciation, and the origins of cancer. Lewin is founding co-editor of Annual Reviews of Animal and Veterinary Biosciences, section editor of the journal uh, Animal Biotechnology, and has served on the editorial board of Physiological Genomics and Annual Reviews of Genomics and Human Genetics. In 2011, Lewin was awarded the Wolf Prize in Agriculture, and in 2013 was elected to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. I'm honored now to introduce our distinguished guest, Shirley Tillman, <clears throat> a leader in the field of molecular biology, Professor Tillman served on the Princeton faculty for 15 years before being named as the university's 19th president in, on May 5th, 2001. During her tenure, she oversaw the creation of major new academic programs, including the Princeton Neuroscience Institute, uh, the Anlinger Center for Energy and the Environment, and the Lewis Center for the Arts. Upon completion of her term in June of 2013, Tillman returned to the faculty 
During her scientific career as a mammalian developmental geneticist, she studies the way in which genes are organized in the genome and regulated during early development. A member of the National Research Council's committee that set the blueprint for the United States effort in the Human Genome Project, she also is one of the founding members of the National Advisory Council of the Human Genome Project for the NIH. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Tillman. I turn over the podium to you now. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here um, at Davis once again. I have uh, been here before as a faculty member, and so it's, it's wonderful to return um, after a hiatus uh, as a faculty member again. I want to thank uh, Chancellor Kahede so much for the invitation to speak in this series. As I look at the individuals who've spoken in this series, I'm a little intimidated, but I'm hoping um, that I can, uh, this afternoon, spend uh, a few minutes before uh, the conversation uh, with the Vice Chancellor uh, talking about uh, this strange topic that I chose for the lecture, the best of times, the worst of times. And it really, the genesis of the topic comes from this very unusual experience of leaving my career as a biomedical scientist 13 years ago and spending 12 years largely not focused on my own uh, discipline of uh, molecular genetics, but spending time learning about what a hedge fund was, which I did not know, um, and uh, thinking about athletic conferences, which why I was happy to know nothing about until then, and uh, learning about the digital humanities, which I thought was a fascinating uh, area of the university that I knew nothing about as well. So I was, I was really distracted from what was going on in biomedical science. So when I returned uh, about a year and a half ago and re-entered the department and began to participate in the activities of my colleagues, the thought that kept going through my mind over and over again was Charles Dickens' famous phrase from A Tale of Two Cities, this is the best of times and this is the worst of times. So let me try and give you a sense of why I thought that. So the best of times. I have never in my uh, now quite long career in biomedical science known a time where there are so many wonderful opportunities to learn new things about the natural world and to translate those things into better lives for everyone on this earth, which is really the purpose of biomedical science. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the things on this slide, but suffice it to say whether you're looking at the field of neuroscience or my old field of genomics or watching a field like metabolism, which had died, and gone into a black hole of science to suddenly be reemergent as metabolomics and to have everyone excited about what that meant to amazing new tools to investigate uh, the nature of genes, which is represented by this uh, uh, diagram on the left at the bottom, which is a, an amazing new tool that I'm so frustrated I was never able to use. Um, it just strikes me if, if I were 22 or 23 years old and trying to decide about what my career should be, going into biomedical science just seems this is the opportunities are almost breathtaking. The best of times. So, why is it feeling as though it is the worst of times? And, and this cartoon, which I took from Science Magazine, pretty much captures the way biomedical scientists today, right now, are feeling about what it feels like uh, to be practicing the art of biomedical science, juggling a lot of things and doing so with a lot of sweat. So I'm going to try in just a few minutes give you a sense of this peculiar dichotomy about the best of times and about the worst of times. And the argument I'm going to try and make in just a few minutes is that there was always a structural flaw in the way we organized our work in biomedical science, which 
was not super damaging until uh, very recently. But, and I'm going to then try and make the argument, unless we fix this flaw, uh, we are going to have a field that is discouraging the best and the brightest, rather than doing what I would hope would be happening to 22-year-olds, which is getting them really excited about the idea of discovering new things in biomedical science. So I want to begin with some history, because our enterprise was really born after the Second World War, and the architect of all of federal research in the United States was this extraordinary man, uh, Vannevar Bush, who was a faculty member at MIT and then became the science advisor to both Presidents Roosevelt and Truman. And toward the end of the war, he wrote this remarkable report, maybe the most influential uh, policy report uh, that has ever been written about science in the United States called Science, the Endless Frontier where he laid out a blueprint for how the United States could make investments in science. Because after all, in, in the minds of many people, the Second World War had proven the power of science to change the direction of history. And, and Bush was a real proponent of this. So I want to give you a sense of what was in this report and how it influenced us uh, going forward. So the, the vision for the endless frontier began, and I read this report about every 10 years to be inspired, because it's truly inspirational. So it says, and I'm going to have to get my glasses out, because I can't see anymore. It's, so the first thing he says is that the federal government should support basic research and provide incentives to the private sector to fund applied research and development. So he saw the role of the government to support sort of basic and fundamental research. And, and he was really talking about creating an ecosystem, a research ecosystem where the public and the private sector collaborated with one another. And one of the great examples of the success of this ecosystem that he proposed uh, was the discovery in the 60s and 70s by the two gentlemen in the slide, uh, Werner Arbor and Ham Smith, of enzymes that were used by bacteria to fight infection by viruses, which are what are those little green things trying to attack that bacterial cell. About as fundamental as you could ever get research. It was curiosity driven. How do bacteria protect themselves from infection? Well, that discovery led in a relatively short period of time to the, dis to the um, discovery of recombinant DNA, to the formation of the biotech industry, the first company, of course, you in California know all about this, the formation of Genentech in 1976, and the first biotech product which came on the market in 1982, which was human insulin. So the ecosystem was working. This is exactly what Bush imagined. Fundamental discovery supported by the government, development supported by the private sector. Now, the second thing that Bush proposed was maybe less obvious, and that is he proposed that those federal dollars, those taxpayers' dollars, should be directed towards research universities, academic medical centers, and research institutes, and not federal labs. Up until this point, that's where federal dollars were going, into federal laboratories. But he wanted to link the conduct of research with the education of future scientists, particularly graduate students. And so he said in his report, the conduct of research should be tied to the education of future scientists, graduate students. And here's the phrase that we forgot. But only that proportion of the youthful talent appropriate to the needs of science. So, what happened after this report was issued and was largely adopted, it took a few years, but it was largely adopted uh, by the government. Well, there was a very dramatic expansion in federal investments in all research. This represents all of research, and, and the, the, I realize it's hard to see these categories, but the one to pay the most attention to is the one in gray in the middle, which is the, the part of the budget that was really growing. And that is the federal support that went to universities. The support to uh, 
intramural programs, which are the federal labs, is the bottom dark blue band, which you can see increased a little bit over the years, but not very much. So we did pretty much what Bush recommended. We invested in universities and we linked research to the training of future scientists. Now, we did this in a way that was not equal across all of the scientists. So if you look in 1976 on the far left, you will see that the support for the various federal agencies was pretty even, you know, with uh, some of the agencies, USDA, the Department of Defense, NASA, DOE, NSF, NIH, were getting roughly similar amounts of federal support. But as you can see, that changed uh, very much um, almost uh, 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 beginning in the early 1980s, where clearly the National Institutes of Health, which is the primary support of biomedical science, um, expanded very much uh, its budget, and it became the primary fe federal agency that was receiving, um, that was giving out support for research. So biomedical research really grew and grew very fast. And given that the plan of Bush was to link research and the training of graduate students, it will not surprise you that at the same time, of course, the number of students studying to be biomedical scientists really grew rapidly at the same time. And that's the blue line, the only line that is really moving upwards uh, on this graph. And you can see how dramatic it was. It wasn't constant. There was kind of a slow growth through the 70s and most of the 80s, and then a couple of really major expansions in the number of graduate students that were supported um, uh, in the United States. Now, you can see that's really in contrast to some of the other sciences. Um, the purple line is chemistry. The number of graduate students in chemistry stayed pretty constant throughout all of this period, as did, interestingly, the number of MDs that were awarded in this country, despite the fact that the population was increasing uh, during this period. The number of MDs uh, were not increasing. So it looks like a system that was in reasonable balance. We're going to support research in universities. We're going to do it by training graduate students. But there was a problem brewing. And the problem was that the number of graduate students was growing faster than the budget. So how could that happen? And how, was, how were those graduate students being supported? And the answer is they were being supported in a way that Van, Van Bush did not anticipate. So his report asked that federal students should be supported with individual fellowships that are awarded to the best and the brightest of their generation. So he wanted to give these students independence and he wanted to give them a student status with their own fellowship. But in fact, this big increase that we saw on the last slide in the number of graduate students was not funded with fellowships. So if you look back to 1979, you can see there were a lot of ways graduate students were being supported in universities. But by 2009, and this has continued until this day, uh, the, the only source of increase to allow this number of students to increase were support on individual research grants of individual faculty. Now well, that seems reasonable. The faculty are conducting research. They need people, graduate students, to conduct their research. What is wrong with having them supported in this way? Well, the answer is the graduate students transformed from being trainees to being workers. And that has had a very significant effect on the culture of biomedical science. And to give you a sense of the problem that it has created, we have created a system that is Malthusian. And the Malthusian system looks something like what I am showing you on uh, the top of the slide, which is you have sort of an average laboratory that might have four graduate students who graduate to become five postdoctoral fellows. And only two members of the lab are actually permanent members of the lab. Or people who were not preparing for other jobs. And that is maybe one technician and then the principal investigator himself. But you realize that this system only works if you're creating jobs for those nine individuals who are in training 
at the same rate that you were training them. It's the only way that you get that nice pipeline that looks so um, uh, nice and uh, well regulated in 1975. But by not 2015, the pipeline looks very different. It has a big, fat bulge in it. And the bulge are largely the postdoctoral fellows for whom there are no jobs. And so they are staying longer and longer in these research laboratories as trainees, being relatively poorly paid, and, and with little prospect of graduating to a job in which they can take advantage of the education that you, the taxpayer, have paid for over the years. Now, this problem would have existed even if we had not then faced the toughest budget woes that the NIH and for, for all of the federal budget has ever faced, and all of us know what that is, which is the recession of 2008. Now, a strange thing happened to biomedical science right before that recession, which is there was an actual doubling of the NIH budget between 1998 and 2003, which is the yellow line uh, going up. Now, all my behavioral psychology friends at Princeton uh, told me at the time that this uh, doubling was happening, they said, beware of a rapid doubling of a budget, because the day that doubling ends, the Congress is going to say, okay, we took care of biomedical science. They're, they're in great shape. We don't have to worry about them anymore. Now we can pay attention to other things. And of course, that plus the recession is exactly what happened. And so literally, the day after the doubling stopped, the value of the NIH budget began to decline in real dollars to the point that today, coupled with the sequester, we are now basically back to where we were before the NIH budget doubled. But in the meantime, a lot of universities and medical centers hired new faculty, um, uh, admitted more graduate students, and in a way this doubling simply exacerbated this Malthusian problem that already existed. So what is the evidence that, that this problem uh, predated the doubling and the sequester, and, but has been sort of brewing for a very long time. I think this is the best evidence I know that that is the case. This is an amazing piece of data from the NIH, which shows you the percentage of NIH investigators, sort of getting their, who have a grant, um, who are younger than 36 years old, and that's the blue line. So in 1980, when I was just starting out my career, I was uh, 30 years old, so I was significantly under the age of 36, and I had a lot of friends who were roughly the same age. You know, we were 16% of the workforce at that point. Today, individuals who are under the age of 36 are 3% of the workforce of independent investigators from the NIH. And 1% of the NIH budget is now being used to fund individuals under the age of 36. So there are no individuals, basically, under the age of 36 anymore in this system. And of course, what has happened is the percentage of investigators who are over the age of 66 has risen very, very dramatically from you know, less than 1% today uh, to now in the neighborhood of, of 7%. And there are now more investigators over the age of 66 than under the age of 36 uh, in the NIH system. This is not a picture of a healthy system. And it's being caused by that bulge in the pipeline where young investigators are stuck as postdoctoral fellows waiting for their chance. I call it the LaGuardia effect. They're circling LaGuardia, and they're waiting for their opportunity to land. And this is just another example of the same, the same phenomenon uh, that shows the aging of the workforce. Uh, the, the very pale red line is the age of uh, faculty at medical centers in this country uh, at the time that I was beginning my career. And I was, you know, roughly in, in toward the middle of that um, 
those two peaks in age at that time. Uh, the dark red line is where we are today. And so you can say there's been a very significant de demographic change uh, that leaves many young investigators in limbo uh, waiting to find a place uh, for them in the system. So where do we stand? So Bush's vision, and I'm going to read you one last statement of, of Bush, um, which I think is very, very important. He said, basic research must be unfettered, curiosity-driven, requires long horizons, the supreme importance of affording the prepared mind complete freedom for the exercise of initiative. A wonderful sort of phrasing of what it means uh, to, to create an environment in which the very best science can be conducted. So today, I would argue that there is now, because of the mismatch between supply and demand of PhDs, there has been created a hyper-competitive environment that is not conducive anymore to producing the very best science. As competition for research grants has become fierce with success rates dipping close to single digits, research and grant reviewers have become risk averse, the worst thing you can be as a scientist, threatening the quality of discovery. And because of this competition, Scientists are spending greater percentage of their time writing and rewriting grants and papers instead of thinking about their science. So the question is, is this a career path that is going to continue to attract the best and the brightest? And this is a problem that um, I began to think about as I began to reemerge into the field and uh, began having conversations with three longtime friends and colleagues. Uh, Harold Varmus, who's head of the National Cancer Institute, uh, Mark Kirshner, who's head of uh, systems biology at Harvard, and Bruce Alberts, the former president of the National Academy of Sciences. And we decided, after meeting um, many times to talk about this, to write a paper that would try and lay out at least what we saw as some of the problems and then to offer some solutions, not because we knew the answer, we didn't, but because we were hoping to stimulate discussion within the community about what needed to be done to, to right the ship, if you want to think about it that way. So here are some of the things that we are opening up for discussion. Some of it is dead easy. Transparency. Graduate programs need to provide accurate career outcomes for prospective graduate students. Students need to know what they're getting into before they apply to graduate school. Diversification and training. 15% of current PhDs will actually become faculty, despite the fact that about 80% of them start graduate school thinking that's what they want to do. They need to know that. But they also need to know all the other things that you can do with a PhD and begin to think about how to do those things well before they receive their PhD. There, the NIH is now um, has a, a grant mechanism that's encouraging graduate programs to think about how to do this. I think we have to reimagine the master's program because not all biologists need to have PhDs. There are wonderful careers available for people with master's degrees, but we don't produce enough of them, I think. Um, we need to significantly increase the use of training grants as a preferred mechanism for graduate support because that brings graduate students back to being trainees as opposed to being workers on research grants. And it allows for a lot of other things to happen. And I think we need to begin to uh, reserve the postdoctoral fellowship period, which is where the big bulge is, for those who are certain they want to go on to research careers as, in, as opposed to all the other things that it's possible to do with PhDs. And too often today, it's the default decision as opposed to a proactive decision. Um, one of the things that we're very pleased about is that there has been a lot of attention being paid in recent years, um, in the last couple of years, to this problem, including this wonderful report that the National Academy of Sciences just produced called The Postdoctoral Experience Revisited, 
which came out with a number of very good recommendations, including doing something about the scandalous pay for postdoctoral fellows, and, and, a, and a, a recommendation that I want to just pursue for one minute uh, further, because I think it is actually a very powerful recommendation, one that's been made many times but has never been taken up. And that is to really think about what is the ultimate structural flaw here, which is the Malthusian lab. And to think about restructuring it in a way that fewer of the people who are conducting research are in the process of being trained to, to uh, succeed their mentors. And so this is sort of a, um, this is the Malthusian lab that I just showed you a few minutes ago. And here's what that report was recommending and which we certainly strongly endorse, which is not a Malthusian laboratory, but a sustainable laboratory. A laboratory that is better balanced for the production of science, which is critically important, and the production of future scientists. And, and the key here is to move some of the trainees into more permanent positions, staff scientists, technical staff, um, uh, and fewer of them in the pipeline on their way to jobs that, frankly, right now do not exist for them. So we're hoping that this idea of staff scientist is something that the scientific community will really take up. There are all kinds of arguments that could be made against it, but I think it is um, a, a great opportunity for us to really get at the heart of the flaw here in the current system, and the reason we all, uh, at least my coworkers and I, wish to do this is because we really do believe that this is the best of times. And we really do believe that the problems are ones that the next generation are just champing at the bit to solve, but we want to give them a fair chance to train to be biomedical scientists and then have an opportunity to actually practice their science. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming today and for listening, and I look forward to the conversation with the Vice Chancellor. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you, Shirley, for your very thought-provoking talk. It's been the topic of many conversations around the country, uh, including in, within the halls of the National Academy where Bruce Alberts presented uh, uh, your plan uh, a couple of years ago, I think it's uh, time for this discussion to be had. Um, you were, it's amazing, of course, uh, you're one of the very few who has gone over to the dark side and returned. <laughs> uh, alive. To alive, <laughs> alive to, to the Academy. And um, I want you to put that dark hat on again for a moment. <laughs> and I'd like to ask you, because you, you, you talked about the kinds of things that, that can be done uh, at, at the level of NIH, but as a university president, you have a responsibility uh, to your students and to, your sta to, the, to the students at the university and the postdocs and the staff. What kinds of institutional policies should we have yeah. to, um, to ensure that the trainees that we have uh, uh, will become uh, members, productive members of the, of the workforce, may join uh, industry or, the, or, or academia, and will have jobs when, when they're done. Yeah. Because there's big money, let's put it there. That climb has uh, put everybody in yeah. the game. This university has a huge biomedical research enterprise, and um, there's a lot at stake because these are the best of times, and yeah. there are so many great research opportunities, and which continues to draw more students to the field. So right. what, what are the policies at the institutional level that we should have to protect uh, our trainees and students? So uh, let me generalize the, the, the answer to the question, if you don't mind, um, because you did ask me to put my university yeah. hat on. <laughs> um, you know, I think it is... Um, very important for a university to take responsibility for ensuring that it is educating uh, graduate students in particular for, for productive careers. And one of the things that I was most proud of Princeton in doing is every year we would, uh, as a group of senior administrators, 
go through every single department looking at the placement of our graduate students and asking, are we placing uh, all of our graduate students in appropriate positions? And you know, without judging what is appropriate, but making sure that they are getting to um, employment that made sense given their graduate education. Um, and uh, clamping down on departments who were unable to demonstrate that their students were going out into the world and being successful. So mm -hmm. we really controlled. Uh, the number of graduate students, and um, which was not popular uh, with some mm. of the faculty who wanted dollars to drive the number of graduate mm. students. And, and our policy was we were not going to let research dollars drive the number of students. That's number one. Uh, number two is preparing our students for the workforce. And, and some of the departments that I admired the very most at Princeton, in this regard, actually, uh, David, uh, were the humanities departments. Um, you know, there, the, all of us know that the, uh, finding a job as a humanities PhD is a very difficult thing these days, but our faculty in many of the humanities department would have placement officers who worked very closely with their graduate students as they got to the point where they were going to go on the job market, um, uh, had them uh, do practice talks if they were going to go for job interviews, um, go over all of their materials and really took it as a, as a responsibility of the department to, to give our students the very best chance to be employed in the future. So I think faculty responsibility is the second thing I would say. Um, and then the third thing, which I really think is, is especially true in our field, in, in biomedical science, is giving students an opportunity to explore all of the options that are available for to use a PhD in biomedical science. Um, you know, when only 15% of them are likely to replace us, that means 85% of them are going to be doing something else. And they need to be thinking about what does it mean to work in industry? What does it mean um, to, uh, you know, to, to get a job where you were writing about science? What does it mean to do science policy work? Um, how, you know, would I enjoy doing science policy work? And if we don't give them opportunities to make those explorations, they're going to do what all few past generations did, which is make the default decision to be a postdoc and create the bulge. So I think those are the things that I think universities right. should be doing. Excellent. Let me ask you to keep your black hat on here for a <laughs> minute. And um, so um, given that, what do you think the institutional approach should be if you're sitting there as president or chancellor or provost toward, um, you know, toward hiring faculty. Um, what is the strategy that you use? Do you go, if the f average age is 42 and you're looking at a postdoc, maybe, uh, you know, a 30 <laughs> year old, have you looked at that at Princeton? Do you know the average age? Is it the same or are you lower or are you just waiting for the to, to yeah. catch the ripe fruit uh, yeah. from the trees and pick off people from UC Davis and, <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> and around the country and, and really just go for the, the very best who already are well-funded. What strategies do you use at Princeton? So, so I'm afraid that I think um, one of the things that this hyper-competitive atmosphere has done is create a very risk-averse mentality in faculty hiring. So you're saying, you know, only 10% are going to get a grant. We, you know, isn't it better to hire someone who already has a grant? Come to Davis, find, you know, your best junior faculty and we'll go after that junior faculty. Um, I, th I think it's a, a strategy that's going to come back to bite us all if we continue to do this. Mm -hmm. And actually the, the grants that I am most excited about at the NIH, and there are too few of them, I, I'd love to see them increase tenfold, are called kangaroo grants. I think they're K00s, and so they've been called kangaroo grants, which fund the last couple of years of a postdoc and then the first three years, I think, as a, as a faculty member. And the whole point of those grants is to find the young postdoc and get them out of their postdoc and into a faculty position as young as possible. I mean, all of us of my generation, um, and I can certainly say, because the four of us talk about this all the time, you know, we were in our late 20s and early 30s when we were running our labs. Right. 
And, and, and it was an incredibly exciting and productive yeah, time. And I think you're different when you're 38 or 42. You just are. You have different responsibilities. Um, you're probably a lot more risk averse. And so we've got to find a way to get those young people into being independent investigators sooner. Right. That's wonderful. I agree with you. Um, you, you did uh, discuss some potential, you know, solutions, ways to approach the problem. There's a recent paper by, um, by Ron, Ron Daniels, yeah, uh, yeah. which uh, had some of the figures that you showed, uh, uh, an article in, in PNAS, which really followed on the study right. that you and, and, and Bruce did. And, uh, you know, one of the things um, that, that Ron pointed out at the end, he's the president of Hopkins, uh, pointed out at the end was that we just lack a, poli we lack a, a national policy a national yeah. science policy, and he recommended that there be some kind of committee, a standing committee, uh, at the level of the of the uh, federal government uh, within NIH or maybe OSTP or elsewhere. Didn't really specify that would be looking at at these problems. Are we in need of a of a national policy, and where should it? How should it be set up so that we can deal with this problem yeah. more effectively on a national scale? You know, I'm, I'm a little averse um, to setting up another committee because, truthfully, we have a lot of government committees who should be taking this on as their responsibility. But I'll tell you, because I've been on more studies of this question than I care to think of, what is really missing is good data. Mm. And, and if, if I had one sort of wish list that for, for a group who, who would uh, take on the question of, you know, what should our policy be in creating the most productive biomedical enterprise that we could, I would say the first thing we've got to have is much better data about the system itself. It's shocking, shocking the things we cannot say about our system. For example, we have no idea how many postdocs there are. Absolutely none. And, and it, there are lots of reasons, because different institutions call them different things. And so you know, trying to get some kind of uh, standardization makes that kind of data collection very, very difficult. Uh, but now, uh, more than half the postdocs in this country are coming from overseas. We don't know where they're coming from. We don't know where they go when they leave. <laughs> if the, and we don't even know if they leave. We have no idea. If you don't know where you know, a significant fraction of your workforce is coming from and where it's going, it's really hard to develop good policy. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's true. And we've, we've sort of created our, our own... Uh, our own mess, and now <laughs> yeah. we have to figure out how to, to, to clean it up. Um, I'll ask you to take off your, your administrator hat now, and uh, let's get down to Shirley the person, <laughs> okay? Which is, I think, what a lot of people here in the community, I see many members of the community have come uh, to hear this talk, which is a wonderful thing about the Chancellor's Colloquium Series. Can you tell us, as a, as a, really as a role model uh, for, for female scientists, uh, in the U.S. and all around the world. Can you tell us who your earliest role models were for you growing up? Well, <clears throat> of course there were no women scientists. So I didn't have a woman scientist as a role model, but I did have a history teacher, strangely enough, um, who probably was the most influential person who uh, at the beginning of grade 10, when I was just starting high school, took my parents aside at parents' night, where my parents had been used to hearing what a good student I was <laughs> and a nice girl, and you know, they would come home all, <gasps> oh, yeah. And he said to them, um, if she doesn't wake up soon, she's gonna be brain dead in 10 years. <laughs> You're a dreamer. And he was right. <laughs> he was right. And what he meant was that I was sailing through life. Mm. You know, life was kind of easy. I, and I was living in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which doesn't sound easy if you know the weather in Winnipeg. <laughs> um, but he meant that I wasn't interrogating my world. And he then provided a way for me to do that. And I think, you know, I, 
I'd be living in Winnipeg right now if it weren't for that man saying, there's a world out there that you need to explore and interrogate and question um, and stop accepting everything. And he was great, so he was my guy. Mr. You, Orlico. Mr. Orlico. Everybody has one. Mine was Mr. Cito, my science teacher. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but you, you made it through and you had many uh, fantastic men. Phil Leader was one yeah. of your mentors yeah. uh, at Harvard, I know, and you had many great uh, male mentors uh, along the way in your career. What, what, what do you tell your, your, um, your female students today and, and how do you approach uh, mentorship given the complex environment? When we started and we got mm -hmm. our first grant, NIH grants at 27 years yeah. old and 28, uh, it, it's a lot different uh, than, right. than the environment today. What do you tell your students and what do you tell your female students in particular who face many different challenges than, than your, mm -hmm. your male students and, and postdocs? So the first thing I tell all students um, who come and want to talk through, do they want to uh, become a biomedical scientist, is that um, don't do it unless you have fire in the belly. You know, don't do it unless when you wake up in the morning, you just can't wait to get into the lab to see how that experiment turned out. Uh, you can barely get your coat off because you just want to know. You can't stand not knowing. Um, because I think it's too hard and the rewards are too modest if you're doing it sort of half-heartedly. So first of all, make sure you really want to do this. Fire in the belly. Fire in the belly. Um, that used to be my test, yeah. was what they did when they came in the morning. If and they, what time if, they if, went home at night. <laughs> well, no, the morning was did. the best test. The morning. <laughs> I, I found it was the best correlation. Um, you know, if they came in and sort of grabbed the New York Times and wanted to chat about last night's baseball game, <laughs> forget it. <laughs> um, the second is don't let anyone turn you into a victim. Mm. And that's for women um, that's scientists. Mm. Um, you can waste a lot of time and energy um, worrying about what somebody said or what somebody meant. Um, I, I honestly believe that the thing that got me through that my early education uh, was great mentors. There's no question, pick your mentors well. But the other is kind of, I, I had blinders on. I just wasn't, I just wasn't gonna listen to that. You know, someone saying, my, I had a physics professor who, who came by at one point when I was doing something really stupid in the lab, and it was stupid, <laughs> and said, that's why there are no women physicists. You know, and, and you, could, you could have taken that and, and let it grind you down, or you could say, I didn't hear that. I don't care. It was stupid. I won't do it again. So I think that's a a really important thing. And then, and then be prepared to defend your turf. Um, yeah. I think you really have to learn in science to defend your turf. And I don't mean be, be territorial, but, but if you have a view, be prepared to speak out and defend it and articulate it. And right. And you see that many times in, in, in the laboratory, uh, in the daily uh, life of students and and, uh, and, and, and just the laboratory ecology, that those that are willing to defend their ideas yeah. the strongest are those are the ones who will, will go on and, and yeah. succeed. And if you're not unwilling to defend your own data, it's uh, pretty tough to survive. And, right. and this, you really have to believe in your data. Right. So you and then the last thing, don't ever let anybody tell me, uh, tell you that you cannot combine family good. and work. It happens all the time. Well, you answered that, almost answered the, my next <laughs> <laughs> question there. Um, uh, and of course, uh, so uh, the question again, since we're on the have your faculty hat on now, is thinking back uh, to the time when you were approached to be the president of Princeton, which um, I guess was a great shock to you <laughs> yes. at that time. Yes. <laughs> uh, 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 and because you've written about it. And uh, so, why did you do it? Uh, 
<coughs> and, and how did you balance your research uh, interests and your responsibilities in an as an administrator and your family life at, mm -hmm. at that time, which was sort of in the, right in the prime years of your, your, your career? You were picked. Um, well, so, so I, th I think the answer to the question of why did I decide to do it, it uh, was really, um, I had um, at that point just was in the process of starting a genomics institute, so I was doing a lot of administrative things. I was building a building, I was hiring faculty, I was raising money, um, and as a consequence, I was not thinking about my science as much as, as I used to. And I was, if I did a really honest self-assessment, I had the feeling that I had already done the best science I was ever going to do. And that I, and that for the next few years, I wasn't going to embarrass Princeton. You know, I was a Howard Hughes investigator. I was, <laughs> I was well-funded. But I wasn't likely to make the big discoveries that I'd made in the past. And so when I weighed that against the possibility of helping an institution that I adored and that had been wonderful for me and my family to become a little bit better. It, it just looked like an easy decision. Mm. Um, so it was really those two things, in, in being balanced, that made me decide to do it, despite the fact I had not the slightest idea what a president did. <laughs> And how did you achieve the balance with your, your children and your family life? Well, my children were, were pretty mm -hmm. much grown by mm -hmm. then. My daughter was in college. My son was about to go to college. And, and so I felt that it was a very good time uh, for me to take on a new responsibility. Um, Wonderful. Candid answers. So my last question before we'll open it up to the audience. Um, would you do it again? In a heartbeat. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, really uh, wonderful and um, illuminating and heartfelt uh, answers to thoughtful answers to those questions. Um, we have time to take questions from the audience. I see Pam Ronald raised their hand first. Pam, you want to step up to the microphone? Please, uh, each of you have a question. Step up so everyone can hear your your questions. Pam. Hello, we're so happy to have you here and thank you both for this uh, forum. Um, I'm very interested in the points you made about graduate students and the need for permanent staff, but I also think about um, senior level people that have been in the lab for 10, 15, sometimes 20 years as permanent staff, but on soft money. Mm -hmm. So for example, National Institute of Health funding. And then when the PI retires or suddenly is not able to obtain funding anymore, there's no, no place for um, those really incredibly valuable staff to go. And I wonder if, if this has come up in your discussions. It has come up. And, and I think there are, there are a number of, of issues that around the staff scientist position that are going to have to be jointly thought through both by institutions as well as by uh, federal agencies that might fund these positions. And I think you've identified the most difficult one. Um, there is, I don't think, any way that you can create these positions with permanence. I think, frankly, most universities in a heartbeat would take away tenure. Um, so we're not going to create a new position uh, with tenure. Um, so, so it is going to be... Um, creating an environment where those people are so valuable. And individuals who have such people in their lab wax poetic mm. about the, the, the value of those people in their laboratories. I, I was lucky enough to have such a person for my whole career. And you know I wouldn't trade him for any graduate student or postdoc. So I think, I think once we can get over the idea that a technical position is a temporary position. Um, and we can build the, the immense value that I think they do have. Uh, I think things will change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent answer. Please step to the microphone if you can. If you're not, we'll recognize you after. Let, let's um, oh, get a question here. Uh, my name is David Flint, and I'm a professor emeritus uh, in the medical center. 
And the, the system you described, of course, our residents and house staff, you know, do work. But what you're describing more is a European system of senior registrars who may stay in a position for many years. But in my lab, we faced a real dilemma. If we were to hire a technician, they were very expensive because of their benefits and all of the things that they had. But a postdoctoral graduate was about half the price. Uh, and because there was a lot of pressure, of course, with other responsibilities uh, in terms of getting funding and getting grants, that we quite honestly looked in our lab for postdoctoral students because we couldn't afford, yeah. afford it. And, you know, and then the, they did stay and they came for a variety of reasons. I wish you would comment on that as the pressures have changed on faculty to get uh, funding, which of course determined our merit and promotions, which indirectly being emeritus affected our retirement, mm -hmm. uh, and the dilemma that we face in terms of the funding of technicians uh, and hiring them versus using uh, postdoctoral graduates as we sure. use house staff and medicine. So you have described perfectly why the Malthusian system exists, which is, is graduate students and postdocs are cheaper <laughs> than staff scientists. So you, you, you've, you've perfectly described it. So, so the argument that I, and I've heard, you know, uh, discussions of this kind over and over and again, and, and here's where I think we have to um, ha, uh, sort of think very hard. Um, I don't know how many graduate students you uh, trained in your lab, and one of my ex-graduate students is here, and I hope she's not going to be offended with what I'm about to say, but it takes about three years before they're productive. Right? So the truth of the matter is, yeah, you agree, right? She agrees. And, and so I think we have this mythology that somehow or other, there, to equate someone who is very professionally trained and who is very experienced, that, that they are not worth more to you, and I would argue they are, than a beginning graduate student who is going to make mistake after mistake after mistake and, and, and you know, not really start being productive for some period of time. And I would say the same is true of most beginning postdoctoral fellows. So I think we have to look hard at what is the real value uh, of having different kinds of individuals in your lab with different kinds of experience and different kinds of longevity. And, and I think what we have done in this country is we have gone so far in one direction, which is the direction of turnover, constant turnover, that, that, that and I'm not advocating that we go to a, a system that it was the old European system where everyone was a permanent member of the laboratory. I think we've got to find a balance in between, and if we can get a balance in between, I think we'll actually produce better science, and that's really what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I came to this lecture out of curiosity, because my knowledge about biology is limited to the seventh grade w working with a frog. <laughs> uh, I'm an economist, particularly on financial institutions, so I can explain something to you about hedge funds pretty early on. <laughs> hedge funds. Hedge funds. Uh, you and Vice Chancellor Lewis discussed the responsibility of universities on a subject. I would like to solicit your views on why you were working with your three other colleagues about mapping out what this industry or this discipline should do to as to provide the best and the brightest go mm -hmm. through the track of basic research and the others will have good career opportunities mm -hmm. after spending years working in this field. Uh, I would imagine you might have talked to leaders in the biotech industry mm -hmm. itself because they are the ones who are going to provide the bulk of the career opportunities for most of our students in this field. I'm interested to hear what is their response 
what's their recommendations that make good sense to you, mm -hmm. and most importantly, they will be utilizing the very talent that universities are building for right. them. Right. What kind of responsibility they feel that they should Very contribute cool. to build a future for those young people. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that Excuse question. Me, I have to sit yeah. <laughs> okay. um, we have actually uh, spoken to people who are uh, uh, leaders in both the pharmaceutical and the biotech industry. Um, one of the things that has exacerbated the size of the bulge is that both of those industries have been um, in decline in terms of the number of people that they are hiring. And so at a time when, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, that was a growth industry. And, and one of the reasons the pipeline worked was because a lot of students were able to go into those industries. Um, you know, that is not happening anymore. So they are not, they, they are not numerically at least contributing to the solution. But what they do tell us, and it's very interesting having conversations with them, is that they are unhappy with the training that the people they do employ in their industry are, have received from us. And, and one of the things that I think we need to really be in much closer dialogue uh, with both of those industries, both pharma and, and biotech, uh, to be sure that we understand what are the skill sets that they want their future PhD scientists to have. And I'll give you the number one thing that comes up every time you talk to them, well, actually two things that come up every time you talk to them. One is the ability to work as a member of a team. Mm -hmm. That's what they want, because that's how science gets done in industry. And they feel that what they get from us are people who are used to, you know, holding on to their own project and, and uh, are working as single individuals. That's number one. Number two is communication skills. The ability to both write and speak very well. And um, despite the fact that many of us believe we are doing things to prepare our students to be good communicators, uh, in their minds, uh, we're not doing as good a job as we probably should. So it's, it was a very good question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name's Eldridge Moores. I'm a, re a retired geosciences professor here at UC Davis. I came here fresh out of my postdoc and PhD from Princeton. Uh, but obviously, uh, your, your thought, talk is very thought-provoking, and I have some idea that a similar kind of running off the rails of the Vannevar Bush uh, vision for uh, fits in my general field of science and probably many other fields of science as well. And can you comment on that? And what would you do about that? Yeah. So it, I, I've had conversations um, with chemists, with physicists, with geoscientists uh, at Princeton about their perception of it. I don't think any of them feel that, that their field is as extreme uh, as what is happening uh, in, in biomedical science, in part because many of those fields, as you well know, are at steady state. Right, you could see, you know, the, the number of, the, the, there, there was no big growth the way there was in biomedical science. But one of the most interesting stories that I heard as I was having these conversations is what happened in, in uh, nuclear physics after the cancellation of the superconducting supercollider in Texas. So, you know, there had been a huge buildup in the number of students in physics who were doing particle physics. And, and of course, with the cancellation of that project, the possibility of employment in that area really declined. And the American Physical Society actually collectively brought together the, the, the leading graduate programs in the country, and they collectively reduced their graduate admissions for the next few years in recognition of the fact that, that the prospects for jobs were going to be very poor. Now, you, whenever I mention that to my colleagues in biomedical science, of course, what they say is, okay, phys particle physics is a very coherent field. You know, you can gather all of the you know, practitioners probably in one huge auditorium. Um, our field is huge and diffuse. And so the likelihood that we could actually do anything as coherent as that is, is unlikely. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was, I was going to follow up on, on what you just said at the end of that answer. And in your paper, you advocated, you and your co-authors advocated that we drastically reduce the number of, of PhDs entering biomedical sciences. And to me, that seems like it would push the hyper-competitiveness to 20-year-olds, which are very difficult to predict who's going to succeed. Right. And, and uh, yeah, just your thoughts on, on that. Yeah, so, so um, we've had a lot of conversations since the paper was published uh, with a lot of um, uh, colleagues, communities. And I, th I would think it's fair to say, we just had a, a meeting last Sunday in New York. Um, that we are, we, we've had many arguments about where the constriction point needs to be, and I think we're now persuaded that probably not at the point of graduate admission, for the simple reason that I completely agree with you. It, um, it's very hard to predict who is going to be successful at the point of graduate admission, which is why we kind of like master's programs that aren't default, that, you know, that aren't sort of consolation prizes, and then real diffusion after the graduate degree, and only those who really want bench scientist careers to go on to postdocs. So we think the constriction works better after graduate school. I, I, that's really good, I'm really happy to hear that. And if you guys could get that out there again, yeah. especially for the graduate students who are feeling yeah. that maybe they shouldn't have entered because of that, part, in part, I mean, yeah. many reasons, but that paper also. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. thanks. Hi. Um, Chuck Langley, uh, I, I, in listening to what you were talking about, I, of course, have read the papers and I'm familiar with it, and I, I see all these things every day. I think it's really important, but this worrying about the demography interacts with another uh, issue which I feel more concerned about, and I wanted to whether you might comment on it. It has to do with the same phenomena, and that is Vandermeer Bush is, is probably equally famous for his inspired understanding of peer review as a foundation for American science. And he didn't bring that up, but in yeah. my mind, that's probably yep. his greatest contribution, mm -hmm. and a very stark and clear uh, insistence on it. And it seems to me that there are a number of forces, including the demography that you're talking about, have put a lot of pressure and a lot of distortion onto peer review process. Right. And if you're sort of a pin, if you have a bent like I do towards sort of paranoid fear, uh, you might think that that's going to be where the real damage yeah. is, yeah. okay? And not, yeah. because you see a cultural change, which there's no, these 20 year olds that you're talking about bringing in, they don't know about that. Right. They're not gonna replace it with that culture. And so I see the cultural damage associated with the yeah. peer review yeah. and with some of the collegial activities and the yeah. institutions to be the biggest threat or the biggest place for damage. Yeah, uh, and, and um, I would say that of the four of us, Mark Kirshner, who is still the most active scientist among the four of us, feels the most pa passionate about this as well. Um, and, and feels how corrosive the, the peer review system. So, so the peer review that we're talking about is both grant review at the level of the NIH, which I think people had great confidence in. They may not have liked the outcome always, but I think for a long time people felt it was a fair system. It was a system that, that found the best grants, but it did it when the success rate was between, what, 30 and 35 percent. People had tremendous confidence in it. We're now approaching 10 percent. Nine out of 10 grants get turned down. And, and now the feeling is that the system is random. That basic, right, it's a crapshoot. And risk averse. And, and tremendously risk averse. Uh, and that's deeply problematic. I, I agree with you completely. The, the, the discussion that, that we have amongst ourselves all the time is, can we cure the peer review if we don't cure the hyper-competition? And we can't figure out how to do that. Yeah. Um, and the other pro problem, uh, which stunned me, I have to say, when I started reading journals again, is, is the, what is now required to publish a paper. <laughs> I mean, there, there are papers now that look to me like 10 papers 20 years ago. 
Um, I mean, you, you know, as things get more competitive, a journal can just up the ante and up the ante and up the ante. And that puts tremendous pressure on the careers of young people who are trying to get papers published so that they can get out and get jobs. But, but again, I don't think we can cure this without curing the underlying problem first. Hmm. So you don't think some of the experimental things that NIH has done, like cutting off the top and the bottom uh, score, uh, they've experimented with that, or single reviewer systems uh, have much, uh, you know, up assigning a single reviewer to proposals have much future? I don't think we know yet. I think we have to test them and mm -hmm. find out. Yeah. Uh, you know, they just haven't been tested long enough mm -hmm. for us to know. But, but one of the most discouraging things was, was honestly talking to my colleagues and hearing their distrust in the quality yeah. of the peer review system. And, and, and when, that, when that confidence gets eroded, it, I, you know, I'm basically agreeing with you. It's really a problem. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for your being here. Uh, you're very inspirational, and we can actually understand what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chancellor Katehi had a speaker at the colloquium, and it was the uh, ch chan Chancellor Emeritus of UCLA. And he said that the public schools don't teach their students how to be alumni but the private schools do. <laughs> Meaning the responsibilities you do have as a, an alumnus uh, once you get out. And I, my wife and I have returned to campus. I graduated here uh, as political science and music. Try to find a, someone to tell you how to get a job with those. <laughs> <laughs> but I did. and. Um, I was an okay student, but I've come back and made great progress in helping students and all. So I, I am here to tell you that you do have a second chance to make a first impression. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the point is, the, right across the street, the Bueller Alumni Center does have these programs. Uh, there was a quote in, in the Sacramento Bee by the dean of the law school here. They said, we're teaching them the law, but we need to teach them how to be lawyers, which is exactly what you're saying, how to mm -hmm. develop a career. The uh, Cal Aggie Alumni Association also has Aggie Diner, the Aggie Diner. And we sit around a round table, and people of various uh, uh, careers, my wife is a, in uh, computer science, and they ask us, how do you get a job? Hmm. And we explain that to them. And we do have a system of uh, practice interviews. And this is all going on through the Alumni Association. Mm -hmm. And I, was, I graduated here in the last century. No, not the 1800s, the, <laughs> the 1900s. <laughs> and I had more opportunities then to figure out how to get a yeah. career. Because we had some classes where, in the music classes, we had three people in the class. And we were getting private mm -hmm. tutoring. But my point is, the Alumni Association is a great resource, and if you've graduated from here, and not, I don't work for them, <laughs> but if you've graduated from Davis and are not a member of the Alumni Association, Association, you should join. My wife and I are both life members. Thank you. Thank you. Well, certainly coming from a university who, whose alumni are rabidly in love with the place, I can tell you how valuable that is to the institution. It really matters to an institution if it has alumni, uh, and not just for financial reasons, although that's important, Let me, don't, don't get me wrong here, um, but, but who um, care about the future of the institution, are willing to work on behalf of current students and future students, uh, and, and who keep you honest, to be, on, to be honest as well. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of a strong alumni uh, base. Hi, I hope you don't mind me asking, but I was wondering what advice you would offer to an aspiring scientist. <laughs> you know, uh, and I'm thinking again with my, my ex-graduate student in the audience, 
One of, one of the pieces of advice that I didn't offer earlier, but I really believe in, is focus, focus, focus. Mm -hmm. You know, find what it is that, that really intrigues you, that you want to understand about the world, and then don't let yourself get distracted from sort of going after it. Because the deeper you go into a problem, the more interesting it gets. It's really true. Um, and you can make almost anything interesting if you get deep enough, but, but you're going to care about some question and you're really going to want to know the answer. And just, just, you know, focus. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan Eisen. Hi. Hey, uh, Jonathan. Jonathan Eisen. Um, I'm wondering if you can comment on another issue that might be related to many of the issues that you talked about, which is the what appears to be a move away from funding individual research projects like R1 grants to this top-down, really large approach to science, which is taking up certainly a significant portion of the budget, and how that plays in the balance of training and, and funding initiatives. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure I have a, a lot of anything in, wise or, or, or interesting to say about it. Um, you know, I, I tend to be a bottom-up person and believe that the bottom-up system for biomedical science, you, know, you obviously you can't do it with a linear accelerator. You've got to be top-down with a linear accelerator. Um, but I think the bottom-up system has worked extremely well for biomedical science, and I would hate to see us, you know, move too far away from that as, as the mechanism. On the other hand, um, and, and I really uh, experienced this today uh, uh, at the Genome Center here at Davis, I think there are ways of organizing our work as biomedical scientists in the future that could be much more effective and productive if we um, figured out how best to organize cores. And, and, and sort of things that, that we don't all have to do ourselves, but it would be really valuable to have an, sort of a, 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 an organization around us that could help us with our individual work. And the, you know, the question I was exploring at lunch was, you know, where's the creativity going to come from? And where does it need to be most effectively directed? And as you know, it's not, you know, sequencing DNA, <laughs> right? That's not creative, and we shouldn't be spending a lot of time doing it anymore individually as individual scientists. But thinking up the experiment you want to do once that DNA gets sequenced, that's what you want to spend your time doing. So I think we need to start thinking about how, how we can organize ourselves with collective action within universities and even between universities so that we spend less time doing scut work and more time doing the most creative stuff. Do, do you see where I'm headed? Yeah, and so it seems that some of the large funding initiatives that have gone to these top-down approaches also have, I mean, they're an opportunity in a way because you could say those programs have to better balance the training of students in those programs or better support staff scientists. Yeah. It just seems like if we're gonna do them, which we are, yeah. that they could be handled in a more organized manner than they currently are being done yeah. to fit in with right. the, the problems that you pointed out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, uh, I really enjoy the talk and I like you saying about the trainee uh, after graduate. And I'm a graduate student from UC Davis, but um, fortunately I went to industry afterwards. I found a job. Um, so I went to one of the retreats of UC Davis uh, of biotechnology. And during that retreat, a lot of students and um, some organizers came to me and asked, do you think there are opportunities? What do you actually need in your company? Mm -hmm. um, I have very limited experience in the industry, and I'm not top-level management. But um, for my experience, I think um, there is a lot of needs we want to have postdoc. We want to have people come in and we know them before you want to hire them. The problem is everyone thinks company has big fat wallet. 
But <laughs> the current situation is everyone's tight. Yeah. So um, I wonder, being a very influential woman on the policy maker, is that any funding or any government consideration for industry to have a postal program or mm -hmm. a program for the near graduate student yeah. to get a chance to be trained? Probably not as direct funding to the private sector. But having a program at Davis that gives a postdoc a chance to do a three-month internship at a company to find out you know, what it is like and is this something that I would like to do, that makes a great deal of sense. Yeah, I agree on that. Yeah. But um, intern is expensive and well. I understand. So I was trying yeah. to see is there any yeah. tax or any place actually the government think, OK, you know, either the NSF had to support those postdocs yeah, yeah. or find some private sectors to support them as well. Right, right. I think it's unlikely. Yeah. But it's an follow, interesting idea. Let me follow on our question. Um, as a president, you no doubt faced with many opportunities to, to develop and build uh, partnerships uh, between uh, government and academia and private industry. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about your, your views and thoughts about that in the modern continuum uh, versus at the, the age of the <laughs> Vannevar Bush, but where we sit today, the importance of that given the funding climate and the kinds of issues uh, you think that mm -hmm. uh, universities face in, in constructing uh, partnerships uh, in a way that protect the rights of faculty right. and That's, students. Yeah. No, I think you put your finger okay. on, the, on the, the major issue that you face every time uh, there's an opportunity to have a partnership with the private sector. Um, and you know, Princeton, like all good research universities, have very successful partnerships with uh, private industry. But the issue that always has to be worked out at the very beginning is to protect the intellectual freedom, particularly of the students and fellows. Um, the faculty, you know, frankly, can take care of themselves. If they're willing to sign an agreement that says they won't publish for six months, God bless them. That's their business. But I think you do have to protect the students and the fellows. And so um, that's, you know, where we look most closely. And then the other issue is always one of who owns the intellectual property rights if they're going to be generated in the, in the collaboration. And you know, I just came off a, a, a major study from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, um, a very good study that, that looked at government university research partnerships. And what was really fascinating, and you may have seen this, is the folks from industry who were on this panel were intensely critical of universities for being difficult on intellectual property issues. And the folks from the universities were deeply critical of industry for being difficult on intellectual property issues. And so there is clearly, as the old saying goes, a failure to communicate um, between the two that, that is unnecessary in my view. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I think there are um, places that do this exceedingly well, and we just need to to promulgate their practices and policies to places that are still trying to figure out how to have those kinds of interactions. Mm. Um, but but I think in this in this era of limited federal funding that doesn't look like it's increasing anytime soon, every university chancellor and president is talking about how to diversify their research revenue. Right. Um, and and uh, sort of getting industry stepping up um, yeah. more is, is something that I think is all yeah. of us have to be thinking about doing. And as the, as the federal funding uh, you know, plateaus or declines, actually the demands by industry on intellectual property right. uh, and, uh, and, and publication uh, constraints actually you know, their demands go up uh, because they have okay. more influence because right. uh, dollars are shrinking, and right. that presents a tremendous challenge uh, right. for many universities. Right. Um, uh, so on, on that, uh, you know, um, the, the time 
for example, uh, the time constraints. Did, have you seen that uh, at Princeton? You know, it used to be 30 days or 60 days, and now we see periods. Is there, and this is what this issue is being wrestled with by our academic senate, mm -hmm. of course, all the way up into the, uh, into the system-wide uh, senate, is, you know, is there a reasonable time frame, uh, and what that, should that time frame be in terms of limitation? on mm -hmm. publication. Um, do you have a feel In biomedical science, it could be different in different fields, but... You know, I, I, uh, I think it is different in different yeah. fields. I think different fields have different publication pressures on them and rates of publication. Um, you know, m my, my optimal number is zero. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, yep. I would prefer to have no constraints on when uh, a right. student is able to publish their work. Um, you know, I start from that premise and then work backwards. Um, How far did you go? You know, I think three months. Um, yeah. yeah, that's it. Very interesting. I mean, we deal with that question yeah. very, very yeah. frequently from faculty. Yeah. And, and uh, very often uh, you find yourself negotiating right. on behalf of, uh, you know, students and, and faculty. And uh, it can get very, very murky in those waters if you're, if you're not careful. Yeah. Uh, it's a, a yeah. very important issue. Okay. All right. Yes. We good? Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. All right. Well, let's thank Shirley, and um, we'll invite Chancellor Cote to make some closing comments today. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Well, Shirley, thank you so much for being here. Thank you all for um, uh, staying with us for the uh, wonderful questions and the discussion. Please join us for a reception right after this uh, presentation, and I hope to see you back for the next lecture. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs>